My name's Jonathan Smart. Um, I'm leading on the adoption of agile and lean principles and practices across Barclays Group globally. Um, result. <laughs> yeah. um, it's tough, tough slot this. There's a lot of competition at this 10.30 slot, so I'm, I'm pleased. Well done, thank you for coming. Um, so we've been, we've been on a, an organizational-wide journey for two and a half years. Beginning of 2015, we started, um, and it's, again, it's the adoption of agile and lean principles and practices across all of Barclays, so all of the parts of Barclays globally, 130,000 people in 40 countries. Um, who of you are a customer of Barclays, either Barclays Bank or Barclay Card? Good show of hands. Okay, so that's probably two-thirds of the room. Um, that's good. Um, I can't promise to solve every problem you've got, or, um, but I t I'll tell you about what we're doing across the firm. Um, and um, you know, the reason why we're doing this is, we, we, just like a lot of companies, there's, there's disruption in the market, there's challenger banks, there's new legislation coming out, um, and we, we are kind of, we're doing this proactively. We're not waiting till we have a survival crisis. You know, we're doing this proactively, um, and as per... Uh, Diana's talk that, um, yesterday morning, VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, and complexity. You know, the world is getting faster, there's more uncertainty, there's more complexity, so we're being proactive in embracing better ways of working. Um, so for, for me to understand a bit more about you in the room, how many of you work at a large company? Okay, good, so about two-thirds of the room. Um, and how many of you uh, are playing a role in terms of the transformation of that company and the way of working? Okay, okay good. Right. You're in the right room. That's good. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to talk about... So, origin, so in, the, in the book, it says, from oil tankers to speedboats, in an agile manner, I've kind of uh, inspected and adapted, and I've, I've renamed it Speed and Control. Um, so I'm going to talk both about our journey adopting Agile and Lean and what we've learned in two and a half years, our learnings through failure, so that hopefully you don't make the same mistakes we made um, and you can learn from our mistakes. Um, and then the kind of the second half, I'm going to talk about speed and control. And I'm going to talk about how to, how to have both speed and control because we cannot have speed out of control. Uh, we're, we're heavily regulated and we, just, we cannot be fragile rather than agile. You know, we've, we've, we've got to be agile, not fragile. We can't, we can't just uh, F it, ship it. Um, as was mentioned yesterday, that might, that might work for some companies, uh, but that would cause headlines for Barclays. And those of you that have bank accounts at Barclays probably wouldn't be too happy. Um, in terms of me, um, so I started out as a developer on the trading floor. I started programming around about 12 years old, uh, ZX81, ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, BBC Model B, Acorn Electron, um, you know, home computer, I'm, I'm that generation. Um, and so I've been developing since I was 12. Um, and, and, I, and I started out in investment banking and I viewed myself as a business technologist. So I've always viewed myself as being 50-50 business and technology, not just being an IT guy. Um, and sitting on the trading floor, right from the very beginning, this was in the early 90s, before it was called Agile, we were working in an Agile manner. I was sitting next to the customers, I was sitting, sitting with the trading desk, and uh, I'd turn around, what would you like? I'd like this, please, let's do this, okay, tap, 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 there you go, what do you think? And it was kind of like a, a, a one or two hourly iteration, um, and that's just how we worked. And we didn't have BAs and developers and testers, we had team members. In fact, we just had a product team, really, was what we had. Um, and in those days, and the people that I then later hired, I didn't hire analysts and testers and developers. I hired people to work in the team who could code and who could do analysis and who could do testing and who'd get a call at 3 o'clock in the morning when it fell over, so therefore you wrote really good, good quality code because you didn't want to get a call at 3 o'clock in the morning. So for me, this is back to the future. This is like back to how, certainly in that context, in that environment, this is how we used to work, and I think that's a really good thing, and that's why I'm so passionate about this. So, Barclays lends, invests, and protects money for customers and clients worldwide. So a bit of the background around the firm. We're 327 years old. We were founded in 1690 near, near the Bank of England, uh, Threadneedle Street. Uh, we've got 120,000 employees in 40 countries, and we have 48 million customers. Um, so we were 
the two goldsmiths were the founders of Barclays um, on Threadneedle Street. And this was four years before the Bank of England existed. So money, paper money didn't exist. And uh, the origins of paper money in the West are goldsmiths writing a receipt. You would deposit your gold with a goldsmith and they would write you a receipt saying, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 20 pounds of gold. And so we were actually printing money. We were writing receipts um, before the Bank of England. So, so we've got a, a kind of quite a long heritage in the industry. Um, and we process 30% of the annual UK gross domestic product every single day. So going through our software and our systems is 600 billion pounds a day. So we can't be fragile. We can't have outages. It's not like Netflix. If Netflix have outages, and they do when AWS has an outage, you can't binge watch The Crown or Orange is the New Black or What are Stranger Things. You know, and they do have outages. Uh, we can't. You know, we, we, will, we will bankrupt companies and just imagine the inconvenience if you don't get your paycheck and you, know, you can't pay for your latte in the coffee shop because the Barclay card doesn't work. Um, you know, so we, we absolutely have to be in control. And it's all about, as you all know, it's all about trust. You know, financial services, banking, it's trust. People want banking, but they don't want banks. We meet a financial need for uh, almost 50% of um, adults in the UK. And one pound in every three pounds spent in the UK is <coughs> spent through Barclay Card. And my clicker's got a delay. Um, and we operate in the most regulated industry. So uh, there is no other industry more regulated. Nuclear, air transport, um, healthcare, uh, where this is the most regulated industry. Uh, with Donald Trump in the US, that might not be the case for much longer. <laughs> so in terms of some lessons learned, so when we started out two and a half years ago, me and my team, we were called the Agile Adoption Team. And we used the A word a lot. And it was an Agile transformation. Now, at uh, the beginning of 2017, we've changed the name of our team. So we're not the Agile Adoption Team anymore. We're now the Better Products Faster Team. And the reason for that is because the A word comes with baggage. And uh, I, hear some, uh, I can hear some, some agreement and some nod, see some nodding in the room. It's the Church of Agile. You know, and what, what flavor of the religion are you? You know, you're the less religion or the safe religion or the dad religion or the scrum religion or the Kanban religion. Um, you know, there are branches of the religion. And for people who are not religious, it's very off-putting. When you go in there and say, product owner, sprint, reorganize, forget everything you ever knew, do less, don't do more. It's, it's very off-putting for people. And, and Dan, at the closing keynote yesterday, spoke about paradigms and paradigm shifts. And people have got mental models really hard to break down that mental model. So there are people who are, like most of you, open to learning as per Diana's opening keynote talk. You're open to learning because you're here. You're embracing new ways of working. And then there are a whole bunch of people that aren't here. So this is a bit of an echo chamber. Um, and then, but there are people who aren't here and don't want to know and don't want to work differently. But when you talk to them about better products faster, it doesn't matter whether you're agile or waterfall. You can carry on being waterfall, but we want you to deliver better products faster. And here's some ways to do it. And that, people can't argue with that. Well, yeah, of course we want better products faster. Why wouldn't we? Our full tagline is better products faster, safer, happier. <laughs> that is what we're about. So if I was in the elevator and I was going from one floor to the next floor, my elevator pitch is that. Better products, faster, safer, happier. Better, higher quality, technical excellence for technology products. And I'm going to talk about agile, not just in technology. Faster, lead time, throughput, work in progress, flow metrics, flow accounting over cost accounting. Businesses have to, have to know their flow metrics. Safer, we're in control, we're in compliance. We're not going to, uh, you know, there's only wood around here, you know, touch wood, you know, things are not going to fall over. Um, you know, touch wood, there's not going to be fraud, and so on and so on and so on. You know, we've, got to, we've got to maintain uptime, resilience. Um, we've got to be in control. And happier, colleague and customer happiness. Colleague happiness in terms of engagement levels going up, because this is a more humane way of working, not the fire drills. So, 
there was a, a, a team that I inherited in Barclays working in a traditional manner, in a waterfall manner. They had uh, the date set by the project manager. This is when you're going to go live. The analysts would take longer and longer and longer to write bigger and bigger Word documents, squeezing the development team down. The development team end date didn't move, and the development team had uh, just even the language there, development team, that, that says it all. You know, analysts and developers were separate. And the development team had this phrase called kill the developer. They would actually enter a phase called kill the developer. That's what they, and it was like the Munchausen syndrome. They were worshipping their kidnapper. Because I, I, would, I would interview them when I inherited this team, and I'd say, well, why didn't you leave? Why don't you go and work somewhere else? And it was, it was this Munchausen syndrome. It's odd. Um, and then the rest of the time, they're sitting there fake busy, you know, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for the BAs to write 70-page Word documents, not really busy. So it's like nothing, manic, nothing, manic. Just ridiculous way of working. So happier, co we have seen colleague engagement go up. We run surveys every six months, and people are getting happier at work because it's sustainable and because they're speaking to the customer, either the internal customer or external customer focus groups, and people are working as teams, genuine, long-lived teams going through forming, storming, norming, performing, the four stages of a team, rather than coming together for a project and then disbanding. Hashtag no projects, Alan. And the next evolution that we went through is from productivity to valuativity. That's obviously a made-up word. Productivity, I would get asked the question often from senior leaders, how do we improve productivity? Tell me how we improve. John, have we improved productivity yet? You're six months in. How's productivity? That's the wrong question. Productivity is, if you look at the definition of productivity, it's how much output you get for a given unit of input. And it isn't just about churning stuff out, because we could produce rubbish quicker. We could produce things that are of low value quicker. It's not about productivity, it's about valuativity. It's about how much value can I produce for a given unit of input. That's what it's about. And so this is like cutting the tail. You've got the value curve, knowing when to cut the tail and move on, um, knowing when to stop. And you do not want people to be 100% utilized. I'm sure a lot of you in, the, in this room know that. As, you, as some of the other talks today, when you get close to 100% utilization of people, the lead time just get, grows exponentially. And we have parts of the firm historically who have played Tetris with projects. They've tried to fit projects in without any gaps. It's like putting cars on the, on the motorway so you can't see any tarmac. And what happens when you put lots of cars on the motorway? Traffic jam. You go, you sit, you go nowhere, and that's exactly what we've seen happening. Um, and this is this mindset shift from resource utilization, productivity, to valuativity. And actually, we don't want people 100% utilized. We want you know, roughly 70 to 80%, I think, is a, good, is a good utilization. We want people innovating. We want people who are not just sitting there coding eight hours a day. So, from better products faster to better value faster, safer, happier. That's our tagline. That's our lesson learned. We have learned this. If I could, could, could go back in time two and a half years ago to myself at the beginning of 2015, this is what I would tell myself. Focus on this, not on agile. Agile for agile's sake. And to quote Peter Drucker, there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently that, that which should not be done at all. So we're, we're really focused on build the right thing and build the thing right, those two things. Not just, build the, not just build the thing and build it quickly, but build the right thing and actually know when to stop and know what not to build as well. The next lesson learnt is whole enterprise agility. So we are not, whilst I have a technology background, we are not applying an agile and lean transformation just to technology because that would be a local optimization. We're applying it across the whole firm. Everybody is in scope. HR, legal, audit, compliance, real estate, all of the, you know, the business, and you know, we, we try to not to delineate between the business and IT. That we have product teams comprised of both business and IT as a partnership. It's not a uh, client server. It's not, we're not service providers in IT. We're, we're partners in product teams. So we are applying 
um, agility across the whole firm. A definition of whole enterprise agility, uh, and credit to Dan North for 90% of this. Um, the speed and effectiveness with which an organization can generate new insights, adapt and respond to them. And I think the, there's a few key words there. The effectiveness, the speed and effectiveness with which an organization can generate new insights, so effectively doing it. And this generate new insights, that requires a specific focus to generate insights. You've got a, you've got a service provider, you've got a service consumer, and you need to get feedback from the service consumer, the feedback loop, get the feedback fast, and you have to take conscious steps to get that feedback. If it's someone you're sitting next to, as, it, as in the example that I gave when I first started out, I could turn around to the internal partner stroke customer and get some feedback. But if this is millions of external customers, something like A-B testing is one way to get feedback. Customer focus groups is another way to get feedback. So agility, it's not just about the team producing stuff quickly, and it's not just about the client receiving it, being willing to receive it on a higher cadence, but it's also about the bit in between. How do you flow the information in between? How do you get the insights back? Because if you're just pushing it out, that's not, you're not getting the feedback. You've not got the feedback loop. And organizations are a network of inter interdependent services. So we've got these, it's a network, it's, it's a little bit like, uh, it's like teams, it's like squads, it's a little bit like microservices. Ooh, I said it. Um, it's a little bit like microservices, it's a little bit like, uh, and you know, Conway's law. Your people architecture, your technical architecture will match your people architecture and vice versa. Um, and organizations, scale that up a level, organizations are a series of interdependent services. And we need to have agility end to end. You know, so all the way in from an idea, a discretionary piece of work or a regulatory piece of work, you know, we need to, in some cases, hire people or we need to find the right people without hiring them. We need to reallocate our people with the right skill set in the right location. We need to prioritize stuff. Um, as per Ozzy's talk on cost of delay yesterday, you, know, you could see the amount of time that initiatives are waiting before they even get to a team to start working on them. It's like 90% you know, of the time is just in the portfolio management process. And then you can optimize the, the software development. 90%, you could reduce lead time 90%, and that will have a 1% impact on the end-to-end -end lead time. The customer will see no difference because it's sitting in the inception stage in the pipeline stage for 90% of the time. So, so we are shifting left and we're trying to fix, you know, with the, the teams are on a good, good path now. We're trying to fix the bit on the left, the portfolio management bit. And organizations need to be purpose-driven, self-managing, shape-shifters. The purpose-driven bit, um, reinventing organizations, Lalu, have any of you read that book? So I recommend reading it. So Teal, Teal Organizations. Um, teal Organizations, uh, according to Lalu, are purpose-driven. So not command and control, but purpose-driven, which is we are, we're going to be the best healthcare company. We'll, you know, we'll, we will care for the elderly, I think was one example in the book. So there, you know, there is a higher level purpose there that people, that people in the company can get around. Um, our purpose at Barclays is to help people achieve their ambitions the right way. So that could be helping people with a mortgage, helping people with a loan, helping people with finance to achieve their ambitions. So there's, there's got to be a clear purpose. Um, Self-managing. So these in, this network of interdependent services, HR, audit, real estate, compliance, legal, need to be able to operate as interdependent services, self-managing to come together to enable flow and to enable business agility. And shapeshifters, so a bit like the T-1000 in um, Terminator, you know, the ability to reform. So there is a, a stressful event. There could be a 2008 market crash. There could be some new challenger banks like Monzo, Starling, Atom Bank are launched. And then how does the organization respond to that? Can, it, can the organization be a shapeshifter? The organization needs to be a shapeshifter. We need to be able to reform around whatever the stress the market event or the stresses, so that we again, so we maximize flow end to end. And there is a name for this. There is a chemical property. It's fixotropic. Have any of you come across this term before? 
couple of, a couple of nods in the room. So thixotropic is, you've got, um, you've, it's a chemical property that when you apply a force, it becomes less viscous. It becomes more fluid. And then when you leave it, it goes more viscous. It goes um, harder. Um, and so for organizations, again, like I said, apply a market stress, the organization needs to be able to reform around that market stress quickly, but then you want to have the strong bonds. You want to have the strong bonds between HR, audit, software development, business partners. You need the strong bonds and you need to be able to then break them quickly and reform them when some, something unexpected happens or there's a new threat or a new challenge or a new opportunity. Can any of you think of something that is thixotropic? Sorry? Quicksand. Quicksand. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, the stress of someone standing on it. Anything else? Whisked egg white. That's a good one. Clay. Yeah. Clay. Clay. Yes. There's, a, there's another, another one that goes, goes well with chips. <laughs> Organizations need to be more like ketchup. You, 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 can, you can tweet me on that. You can quote me. Um, so when you, get, when you get back to your workplace you can, and someone asks you what you learned, you can say you've learned that organizations need to be more like ketchup. <laughs> Was that really worth going to that conference? <laughs> um, yeah, ketchup. Um, you apply stress, you shake the bottle, you force it, it goes more runny. Um, apparently, did you know if you tap the 57 with two fingers, do you know the ketchup comes out more easily? I did some research on the thixotropic qualities of ketchup last night and apparently if you tap that 57 apparently it comes out more easily I just I just do that and then it all comes out um, agile outside IT so whole enterprise agility so this is our audit department no well there's there's more than two people but <laughs> our audit department have adopted an agile way of working uh, this is a Kanban board, and this is not a staged photo, which is why they're both pointing at two different tickets. <laughs> mm. Ooh, look at that. Um, so our audit department have adopted uh, an agile way of working, nothing to do with technology. The audit, department, the audit department used to run many audits concurrently. So as an auditor, as an auditor, the auditor would be running um, five, six, seven audits concurrently. There'd be time slicing between the audits. The audits would have a long lead time. Um, and as an auditee, and I've been on the receiving end of a number of audits, it was really painful because I would I'd have radio silence for a long time. There'd be a lot of field work, and then I'd get the ka -chunk thud of here's our conclusions. And there'd been no conversation on the way to correct misunderstandings. So then what ensued was then another long lead time of conversations to say, no, you've misunderstood, you didn't look at this, what about this? So it was, again, a very inefficient way of working. And I'm really pleased to say that our head of audit, we had a new head of audit came in, and she was very open-minded to new ways of working, and she was very willing to experiment, and she had courage. And she is a transformational leader. And this is, I'm coming back to this, this is a really important point. Diana made this point around courage, compassion and confidence. You need courage. And our head of audit exhibited courage. She said, right, audit department, we are going to work a different way. We're going to start out with an experiment with one team in one area with one board, which they did. And this is Agile Andy. This is a coach. Um, and got Agile Andy in. And um, Agile Andy helped with the first team. Sam is a permanent member of staff. No, no previous experience with Agile and Agile Andy coach Sam. Now Sam is now training the trainer internally, permanent members of staff. And so now what happens is you've got long-lived audit teams who stay together and they're aligned to a value stream. So the value stream might be equity trading, for example, or mortgages. And they stay in that domain so they, they actually get to understand what the customer wants. Previously they didn't, they were doing like, you know, one on equity trading, one on mortgages, one on currency trading, and they never really had a long-lived association with the value stream, and now they do. And now they've already shaved a third off of the lead time for an audit report, and they're going to shave another third off, so it will end up being a third of the time 
to, for an audit report to be produced, and they deliver a walking skeleton. So every week, there's a, here's what we think, here's what we think, here's what we think, and that enables early and often conversation to say, you know, you've misunderstood, you didn't look at this evidence, go and speak to these people. So there's a whole lot less rework. It's a much more efficient way of working. This is our real estate department. So this board is where our uh, global head of real estate for Barclays Group stands. Um, she stands there with her team, and they no longer, there's no seats in this room. It's a, it's a, it's a war room. It's, it's three-sided. It's open on the far end. And um, they stand there, and they don't have a PowerPoint deck like they used to. They stand at a Kanban board. And this is, you know, we've got thousands of property, no, tens, hundreds of thousands of properties globally, and it's managed using post-it notes. It's managed with a Kanban board and a stand-up and conversation. And of course, there's PowerPoint decks and other stuff as well, but this is how they manage their work. And they are limiting their work in progress. And we had a third party come in, a third party real estate company came in to do a particular campus move in Canary Wharf in London. And we asked this third party real estate company to work this way. And I went into the room. On the right hand side, they had the traditional Microsoft Project Gantt charts stuck up on the wall, which they'd done about six months ago and hadn't been updated. On this side of the room, they had four Kanban boards. And I had a chat with them. They'd never worked this way before. It was the first time. And I said, OK, which do you prefer? This one, we prefer the Kanban boards. Um, when you go to your next client that's not Barclays, are you going to work that way or that way? That way. So th they are always going to work that way now. Again, nothing to do with IT, nothing to do with technology. It's just a better way of working. Visualizing work, limiting work in progress, being able to see the blockers, being able to see the impediments, having conversations. So that's for, the, that's for real estate. The next learning. Um, so this learning is, it's easier to act your way to a new way of thinking than it is to think your way to a new way of acting. So what do I mean by that? Sticking people on a two-day certified Scrum Master course, sticking them back into the workplace and say, go and be agile, is not a good approach. <laughs> and substitute CSM with any other certification you like. CSP, whatever. CPO, you know, lots of TLAs. KMP, you name it. Um, so just asking people to think differently, just putting people on a training course, and just getting coaches, just getting coaches in, and saying, go and be agile, go and be lean, will not, generally will not work unless there is already a fertile soil and people there already get it and have some previous experience. And we've learned this the hard way. We have made a mistake in one part of the business. In one part of the business, we did that. We put people on training courses. We hired uh, a whole load of coaches. At one point in London, I think pretty, it was hard to get a coach because they were all working at Barclays. And it was a kind of spray and pray type approach. You know, it was like, well, let, let's hope something sticks. Um, now, it, it wasn't consciously like that, clearly. Yeah, we thought we were doing the right thing. Um, and it, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, didn't lead to lasting results. So. What one needs to do, and this is from John Shook, who was the first American manager at Toyota, is the old model is to change thinking to change behavior. So tell people to think differently, put people on a training course. The, the new approach to change, a better approach to change, which Japanese companies do, is change behavior to change thinking. So, at Japanese companies, if you join a firm like Toyota, you are put into a different system of work. You are put into a different way of working. And for Japanese companies that go through lean transformations, there is courage, there is transformational leadership, and the leaders will say, we are changing the way we're working, and they change the system of work. So that does mean, if you want to take a scrum approach or a Kanban approach, what that means is, we are going to change the system of work. We are no longer going to have this very long lead time with a group of project managers and a group of BAs spending six months doing the analysis before it gets to a developer. We're going to start out with, OK, let's pick one team, one product, one area. Right, get together as a multidisciplinary team. We want you to now start, start skiing. Basically, don't sit in a classroom 
it's like learning to ski. You sit in a classroom and be told how to ski. You're not going to be able to ski. You've got to go skiing. So basically this is saying, go skiing. You've just got to do it, and you've got to change the system of work. So we, we in one part of Barclays, we didn't do that. And we kind of said, there you go, you figure it, not you figure it out, but here's some training, here's some support. And, and the problem is, is that, to quote Deming, a, a bad system will beat a good person every single time. People cannot overcome the system. Colleagues cannot overcome the system by themselves. It requires leadership to be willing to say, change the system of work. So this is now what we're doing. We are fundamentally changing the system of work at Barclays, and, and we've learned this. We had two, so we've had two years. This took us two years to realize this in one particular part of the business. In another part of the business, the soil was fertile. People did get it already. There were, there were enough natural champions that that, organization, that part of the organization um, self-solved and did a fantastic job. They pivoted from projects to long-lived products. The word pro we don't use the word project anymore. We have long-lived products with long-lived teams, and we have business outcomes. We have initiatives, so we still have funded work, obviously, but we don't call them projects because projects denotes temporary, and we don't want temporary. We want long-lived teams on long-lived products with investments and with business outcomes, which I'll come back to. Um, another learning is it's from I'll believe it when I see it to I'll see it when I believe it. So rational thought doesn't exist. As Dan said, people have paradigms. It's a paradigm shift. So it's not a case of I'll believe it when I see it. So we can do Gemba walks. We can do agile safaris. We can take people from one area, take them to another area and say, look, look at what this team are doing. Look at their great outcomes. Yeah, well, we're special. We're different. We've got different customers. You know, we've got all this legacy. Um, so people, people don't believe it when they see it. People see it when they believe it. And, and breaking through that paradigm shift is really hard. It's really, really hard, especially as you get into the late majority and the laggards. You know, so our, the normal distribution, crossing the chasm, early adopters, early majority, late majority, laggards. You know, we are into the late majority and the laggards now, so we're, we're encountering the, the critics, the strong critics. Um, and it's definitely a case of I'll see it when I believe it. Um, interestingly, on room F, I saw that someone had printed this out and stuck it on the door. Um, I don't know whose talk it is, but it seems that there's another talk down there talking about the same thing. Cognitive biases. This is, uh, there are hundreds of cognitive biases. So this is a picture of cognitive biases. Did you know that there's a bias against having cognitive biases? <laughs> it's called the bias bias. It's a true fact. Um, and. And so, you know, with all of these biases at play, again, this doesn't apply to me, can't, can't possibly work, we're different, we're unique, we've got special customers, we've got these legacy systems, we can't do it, we're mainframe, so we can't do it. That's not true, we're doing it on mainframe. We've halved the lead time on mainframe, 50-year-old code. Um, so there's all of these cognitive biases to overcome. Um, and, it's, and it can be fake news. Um, I'll see it when I believe it. In fact, I'll even, I'll even see it when it doesn't exist if I believe it. So Donald, Donald Trump reckoned he saw one and a half million people at his inauguration. Um, so imagine you're a radiologist and you're looking for white cancerous lumps in this lung x-ray. So have a look at those white dots on there. Are any, now, so you've got to pick out which white dots are cancer. Uh, so don't give it away. Did, did any of you spot anything there that was odd? Yeah, a few, a few nods, okay. Did any of you not spot something odd? And get willing to admit it? <laughs> no, one's, no, one's, no one's willing to admit it. There's a gorilla in the picture. What percentage of radiologists, so this experiment was run with a, with a whole bunch of radiologists, what percentage of radiologists saw that gorilla in the picture, do you think? Sorry? 30? 10, 17%, 17% of very, very, very highly qualified, talented radiologists, only 17% saw the gorilla in that picture. 83% of radiologists did not see that picture. There's, there's another example of this where there's people in white t-shirts and black t-shirts passing a ball, and the, you know, and the people watching the video are asked to count how many times the ball is passed. Someone walks through the shot in a gorilla suit like this, and, 
and, it's, and what, guess what percentage of people actually notice someone walking past in a gorilla suit? <laughs> no, this one was a bit more obvious. This one was about 50%. So 50% of the people didn't notice somebody walking across the shot in a gorilla suit. Um, and so this is inattentional blindness. What we ask people to look for will in part determine what they see. So around a transformation and around different ways of working and around a focus on flow, if we're not looking at flow, people are not going to see it. And, and we have seen this. One part of our business, the most traditional, the most waterfall, they, they, the bit that's playing Tetris, the bit that's trying to pack the cars on the motorway, they, they haven't seen what the problem is because they're so busy trying to pack the cars on the motorway. And they're so busy trying to go for 100% resource utilization. Just be careful how much of this you tweet because I'm being very candid. Um, so shine a light on the system of work. You've got to shine a light on the system of work. Um, and so what I mean by this is expose the flow metrics, expose the lead time, expose, expose the multiple cycle times that lead up to the lead time, the end-to-end -end lead time. Shine a light on it. Surface the metrics, so visibility. Kanban boards are great for this in terms of visibility of you can see where things are blocked. In knowledge work, you can't see the inventory stacked up next to the machine. In a factory floor, you can. So we've got to show the inventory stacked up next to the machines. Kanban boards are great for that in terms of you can see this long list of post-it notes all stuck somewhere. But also we're doing this across the group. We've got 30,000 people in technology, five business lines, and we're pulling in the flow metrics from all of the systems across all of the firm, and we are starting to shine a light on this. So for the bit that's been playing Tetris and packing the work on, we have really recently now got lead time data, cycle time data. Um, there's some scary stuff in there, but the great thing is that we can now shine a light on it and we can now improve on it. In terms of how we're measuring success, and our, so measurement is a very difficult topic. Uh, it's a very tricky topic. And in terms of how we're measuring it, so first of all, flow. So we're measuring lead time, throughput, work in progress, release cadence. So we're measuring that and we're surfacing that. We're making that visible across the group. And we're, we're specifically, it's a vector metric. So for each business area, how is your lead time trend? It's a, it's, so it's not, you know, it's two weeks, it's three months, because we can't compare three months on mainframe to two weeks on a web stack. You know, we can't. So therefore, it's like it's, it's, it's a vector metric. So how, how have you improved your lead time? We're measuring quality. So escaped defects, incidents in production. A, a, a bug that is not in production is not a bug. It's just work that's not finished. Control. So control is, as a heavily regulated industry, we have to be in compliance information security, information risk management, encrypting data. You know, we don't want to have a data leakage. We don't want to be making the headlines in the newspapers. Um, you don't want us to, to be leaking your, your personal data, of course. So things like encryption, um, information security, cyber security, not being hacked. Um, so we've got all of these controls that we build in. And so we measure control compliance, which I'm going to touch on. Happiness, like I said, through employee opinion surveys and business outcomes. This is the valutivity. So we've got quarterly business outcomes. So not milestones, not development done, testing done, but net promoter score increased by 5%, mortgages sold, current accounts that have been opened, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we are defining things not as activities, but as business outcomes. And we are looking for the business outcomes to, to be delivered once a quarter. So back to the better products faster, fine, carry on being waterfall, so long as you deliver a business outcome every quarter. And, and very soon people end up doing mini waterfalls and before they know it, it's like, oh, let's optimize and, oh, now we're doing it every two weeks. Um, Kevin Mayer is um, a lean expert. Um, he's in the States. Uh, he runs a, a, a lean consulting company and he blogged on the 4th of November 2008, about a visit that he 
did to a bunch of Japanese companies looking at their lean transformations. And he summed up, and, I, and this, this really resonates, he summed up his learnings from his visits, his Gemba walks, to these Japanese companies in three words. And this resonates, and it's surprisingly similar to Diana. Courageous, smart, and patient. Companies, need, as I said, need to have courage. There needs to be transformational leadership. For those of you that have read the DevOps um, survey 2017, the Puppet Labs sponsored DevOps survey, um, you will know that the number one finding was, is transformational leadership determines success. If you haven't read the DevOps survey 2017, I recommend you Google it and you read it. It requires courage from leadership. It requires transformational leadership. You're right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Good point. Um, thank you. Oh, I, I will correct that. Um, I didn't misspell, misspell smart, which is a good job, given that's my, <laughs> given that's my, my surname. Is this a sales pitch? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you need to be courageous. You need to employ me. Um, and I'm kidding. And, and then you need patience. Um, so, very similar to us, Diana said, um, you know, remarkably similar. Um, the smart bit is to, is, so courage is change a system of work. Smart is back it up with coaching and training and support. Patience is it takes a long time. And I think it was Dan last night who was saying five to 15 years was what Goldratt said in his interview, Beyond the Goal. And I can agree with that, you know, five to 15 years. There's another guy called Colin Price who's written a book called Accelerating Performance. He used to work at McKinsey. He's looked at hundreds of companies in the FTSE 100 over a seven-year period, and he said it's a minimum of four years. So they plot companies into five, five sections, from worst performing to best performing, and the, the fastest he has seen a company go from one section to the next section is four years. Going back the other way, about six months. The, the next learning is use the force, Luke. I've got to get a Star Wars reference in there somewhere. Um, this is the Kubler-Ross curve. Are any of you familiar with the Kubler-Ross curve? One, two, okay, three, a few people. So this is like, like the Gartner hype cycle. You've got the peak of excitement. Uh, you've got the trough of disillusionment. And then hopefully you climb your way up out of the hole. There. And what we see is we see this pattern time and time and time and time again. This is a very predictable pattern. Effectively, it's a J curve. And what we see is we see there is the peak of excitement. So it's like, yay, we're going on a journey. We're, we're doing this agile transformation. We're excellent. And there's this fanfare, razzmatazz, and the A word is used a lot. Um, <laughs> And senior leaders are coming out and talking about it. And then within about six months, they're saying, have, you done, have we done it yet? Are we there? Um, and uh, as a lot of you will know, you're, you're never done on this journey. There is not an end date. Um, and then it's like, oh, actually, this is really difficult. A bit like learning to ski. Uh, my feet hurt. My legs hurt. I'm cold. I'm wet. I keep falling over. Um, and it's like, well, just keep going through it. Keep going. And then eventually, you become good at skiing. And then, oh, wow, this is fantastic. I love it. I want to go again. That's a very, very similar uh, learning journey, very similar pattern here. And those gold stars, those, they, oh, I can plot each business area in the firm on that curve. We know exactly where they are. And for those of you that are leading or influencing transformations in your company, my kind of, the learning to myself that I would go back and tell myself is the intervention differs depending where you are on that curve. If you're up here, make the most of it, wheel out your senior leaders, get the budget, like, um, you know, really pull on the courage, really ask your leaders to exhibit courage and to say, we want transformational change because it will run out, you know, the, the goodwill will run out at a certain point. And then you get into crisis, and this is where you really need to hunker down. You need to be resilient. You need personal resilience. And like the burnout talk um, from Anna, you know, you need personal resilience to stick with it. Shining a light, back to the shining a light, the surfacing the flow metrics helps massively. And in fact, that is how we are climbing out of that hole for one of the business areas is by shining a light on the flow metrics. 
And then when you get to the top, there's another one. And then there's another one, and there's another one. Um, so I'm now going to talk about do the right thing and do the thing right. And uh, the terminology we're using is lean control and lean portfolio management. So lean control, by control I mean compliance. I mean legal, information security, information risk management, making sure we're complying to our standards. Um, lean portfolio management is doing the right thing. That bit I mentioned at the beginning where things are waiting for a very long time before they even get to a team. So on lean control, do the thing right. Um, so what we do is we play a game called Cows in the Meadow. And we do this with our control professionals. So we have probably over 1,000 people in Barclays whose job it is um, to effectively prevent change. <laughs> it's information risk management. It's information security. Uh, it's fraud. It's anti-money laundering. It's technology risk. You need to do more testing. Um, it's enterprise architecture. It's service management. It's, so all of these control and compliance functions who are not necessarily part of the development team. The way we've worked historically is in a waterfall manner. So a team will, you know, very sequentially, analysis, dev, test, build the thing, and then they will engage with the control person once they found them. So you have to e email the whole bunch of people, find the right person, and when you found them, they then say, the computer says no. Uh, uh, uh. Go back to you know, 20, go to 10. And you have to go back to the beginning again. And now you've got to go and, go and implement the controls that you didn't implement in the first place. So in 2015, we had, like a, we had a lighthouse agile project team. Did, I, I used the project word. Sorry, Anne. Um, we had a lighthouse um, initiative. And it was all like fantastically developed and built. And then we hit the brakes when we, when we engaged control. And it's like, ah, oh, god damn it. We didn't engage them early enough. So what we do, we do this game with our control professionals. So you know, they are not developers, they're not product development people, they are control professionals. We play this game, and the, the mission of the game, the mission of the game is draw a beautiful summer meadow with blue and red flowers in green grass some cows and birds under a shining sun. And we have uh, two, type, two ways of working, a traditional way of working and an agile way of working. This is the output. Which do you think looks better? The left, obviously, yes. So, on the left, you can see we've got sun, we've got birds with some perspective, we've got some cows. Again, there's perspective. This cow is bigger than that cow. That cow's smaller because it's further away. We've got some flowers. Over on the right-hand side, this was done with a waterfall team. They had role specialization. They had the blue flower person, the red flower person, the green grass person, the cow person. And the control tribe member, the control, per the control member didn't engage with them. They stood deliberately aloof on their Blackberry or on their phone not engaging, waiting for the team to come to them. On the left, the control person, who's a stooge, the control person engaged with them. How's it going? Make sure you've got some perspective. Make sure you've kind of got gravity applying. Over here, we've got an upside down cow crossed out with the word oops. <laughs> it looks like maybe it's going to heaven, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> we've got some birds standing in the sky. Uh, you know, so obviously, gravity is not applying in this case. Um, we've got some blue flowers, and we've got some red flowers, and we've got some grass. The flowers are in the sky as well. Um, I'm not sure what those green things are. I think, I think those are green flowers, but nobody asked for green flowers. So this waterfall team have just have developed some functionality that no one actually asked for. Um, and there's no perspective as well. Those, maybe those are calves. I'm not really sure. They're very small. So this helps our control teams understand why it's important to work as part of a multidisciplinary team. Effectively, it's a secondary role. I'm going to go quickly now because um, I'm running out of time. So we've created control tribes. And um, control tribes, they're multidisciplinary. So it's someone from risk management, someone from information security, someone from fraud. Rather than them working in their silos, they're long-lived in a multidisciplinary control tribe aligned to a value stream. So the value stream could be equity trading. It could be mortgages, whatever it is. And we've implemented a lean control tool. And the lean control tool supports teams in understanding what controls apply to them, because we have pretty much one standard for each year of our existence, over 300 standards. Just think of 300 years of audit points. The scar tissue, 
that Dan was talking about yesterday. We've got lots of scar tissue. Um, so with the liquid the control tool, it's a conversation. These are the controls that apply in your context for your business outcome. Previously, it was up to a project manager to try and figure out across 300 standards what they needed to implement in terms of security or whatever, whatever, whatever. This makes it much easier. Uh, conversation with the SME, there's an engagement health indicator so we can surface uh, any engagement issues. Um, it isn't a case of don't only automate all the things. It, you know, there does need to be a conversation there. So it isn't just about CD, CI, um, and automating everything. There, there does need to be a conversation. And effectively, it's compliance DevOps. Um, DevSecOps is too late. You're doing, if it's DevSecOps, the sec bit is in the wrong order. If you've already done the dev and then you do the sec, you've you already failed. It needs to be sec DevOps or compliance DevOps. Lean portfolio management, this is my last section, I was conscious of time. Um, so we are moving to hypothesis-driven investment. We started out with annual planning, annual budgets, a lack of financial agility, very hard to pivot, very hard to change direction. And we are moving to, we believe doing this thing will result in this outcome. We will have confidence to proceed when we see a measurable signal. And we have a monthly cadence on this as a quarterly business outcome. So a bit like an OKR, objective and key results that LinkedIn use, Google use, Facebook, Uber, the unicorns use OKRs. Um, it's a bit like an OKR and, we, and we are, we're looking for progress. And if we don't get progress or we get a signal that actually this is a bad idea, then we'll kill it. And we don't need to wait till 2018 to kill it. Um, so quarterly business outcomes over milestones, rolling wave, over annual, learning and optionality over sunk cost. You know, we're maintaining optionality to the last responsible moment. Incremental build of a business case. So we'll do the first one in about a day, the second one in about three days, and, and, and lots get killed at that point. That's not being the right thing to follow up on. Obeyer rooms, um, so this is my last slide. Um, Obeyer rooms, performance room, uh, a war room. I don't really like that term a performance room, so we've got increasing use of obeyer rooms, and this is an example. This is uh, Barclay Card Partner Finance, Barclays Partner Finance. If you buy a Tesla in the UK and you buy it on finance, it's Barclays providing the finance. Or if you go into an Apple store and you buy an Apple product on finance, it's Barclays providing the finance behind the scenes. And um, here, this is the CEO's priorities here, and the CEO of the business stands in this room. This is a series of business outcomes with clear alignment, so Hoshin Kanri, kind of alignment to strategy, clear alignment to the strategy. This is a refinement of the business outcomes. This is a Kanban process from the CEO all the way down to the, to the teams that are building the, the products. These are features from these business outcomes that are pulled and refined. This again is a refinement of the feature so you can see here, ready to pull, feature in refinement, and then the feature comes over here. And these are the teams. You can see Team Delta, Team Tetris. Hopefully they're not playing Tetris. Um, and they're pulling one feature at a time. They've got a burn up on that feature, and they're limiting their work in progress to one feature. The feature is about a month. The business outcome is about three months. The feature breaks down into stories, maybe either four iterations of one week or two iterations of two weeks. And on the other wall, there's a whole bunch of cumulative flow diagrams, CFDs. So we can see visually at the portfolio level, the, at the top level, at multiple levels, this is you know, multiple level Kanban, we can see where there's a blockage in the system. We can see the lead time. We can see the work in progress. Um, so what we've seen is lead time halved. For deep agile teams, so we've got a, a, about 40, 42 deep agile teams. Lead time half, throughput doubled, cost 30 to 50% down, average incidence 70% reduced, engagement up, net promoter score up. Um, so basically, twice the work in half the time for half the cost. <laughs> and speed and control, when you've got good breaks, you can go faster. So the better the brakes on that bobsleigh, the faster it can go, because the faster it can stop. So we've been working on, on having really good brakes so that we can go faster. Thank you.